Yeah, my name is Lena Venegas, and I identify as a displaced person. I was bought um, from Colombia and taken to the United States. Um, I was raised by a white um, Jewish middle middle class couple. Um, I am a social worker. I work in um, trauma and suicide and mental health. I give presentations. I do trainings. Um, I do, you know, different kinds of consultations. I talk a lot about the lived experience of being a transracial, interracial, displaced person, because to me that that voice isn't really amplified and it isn't really heard. So I do what I can to amplify that. Um, I have a podcast called Rescripting the Narrative, and I'm a co-host and co-founder of that. Um, I'm trying to think of what else. I think I miss everything. <laughs> Um, and it's hard to like post everything, you know, on social media that we're doing. I posted about it before. Yeah, we reached a year. Um, we're, we're kind of taking it slow because we're both living our lives and we don't want to be rushed to have to like put out content. So we have a few episodes now, but we'll, we'll, we'll continue to work on it. I, mean, I don't have a ton of, I mean, I know I did, I am in reunion, so I did find, um, some of my family, some of my family is still out there that I don't know how to identify them. I know that I'm from Colombia and I, I, I've been back to the orphanage that I was bought and sold from. Um, and they've been caught up in a lot of corruption as so many of these places have. Um, Vice Magazine highlighted some of the, it was an article in Spanish, but it highlights it highlighted um, like all the corruption and just this horrible things that that orphanage is doing, but yet they're still around. They're still buying and selling babies. And, you know, they haven't been one that um, has been shut down. There were connections, the owner of it, um, she had connections with the government. So of course, you know, we know the political systems are benefiting from um, family separation, also known as an adoption. So they're not going to shut it down anytime soon. The orphanage, what was that like? It was terrible. They were, um, I was in a different place. Like that was right. Like I was still a teenager when I went to go back and visit. And I wish that I hadn't had that experience at that age because it was super traumatizing. And I, I didn't have any support as a displaced person as a teenager or really young adulthood. It's like all the work that I had to do by myself and find people just like so many adopted and displaced people. So my story is not, you know, an anomaly. A lot of us don't have any support. We live in race, racial isolation. We live like without genetic mirror. So it's very common, but I wish I hadn't gone at that age because it was very traumatizing. I didn't have the language. I didn't have any support there. And now looking back, it was like, I was a pawn, like, again, they like kind of like used me again to sell their merchandise, meaning children, because when I went back, they were like, um, you know, she was adopted, you know, and like, kind of just like making it out to be this great story. And I was there with the people that bought me. And then um, I, this is really traumatizing and it should have like a trigger warning to it. But um, I actually saw like a baby being like, I don't know what the word would be, but like, I guess the sale had already happened. And so they gave the baby to the people that bought the baby. And that was just like a really awful experience to, to witness, you know what I mean? Like, and I was like in a different state, but I just remember being like, just crying and crying and crying and like, nobody acknowledged it at all. And I think maybe people took it to me and like, I was so, you know, the narrative of being so grateful and chosen in a better life. And they probably brushed it off that way. But yeah, uh, it was a really horrible experience. A real, I mean, I wish I hadn't gone back at that time and I had been prepared um, and had some boundaries and had some support when I went back there. But yeah, I mean, again, they kind of used me to just like tokenize me as this great experience that I've had, but they, I wasn't saying those words they were. They were telling other families that were there to complete the transaction of buying a child, you know, so they wanted to make those buyers really, you know, feel really good about what they did. And like, oh, look at this 
look at this girl, look at this child, you know, everything's great. She lives in America. Look at these people, you know, she's coming back here, you know, so that was really, again, they used me for their own, you know, benefit. Yeah. So awful. That's yeah. so exploitative and so bad. And like, yeah. and did your, um, the people that bought you, like, were they, uh, you know how were they and like how did they sort of do you remember like were you able to talk to them about like the trauma or no not at all I didn't do any of that you know because they were the they were throughout my childhood you know and adulthood and I don't have a relationship with them now but they would tell me that they rescued me and they would talk bad about my mother and my country um so I mean they were not like safe people obviously they're not my life now for a reason but yeah, so I was just basically on my own. And I just think about, oh, that poor 18 year old child, like me, an 18 year old, that poor, you know, child there in that situation, like how, tra that's like, just like another trauma, you know, and I just think like, oh, that's just, yeah, I mean, if we, if we're going to go back to the orphanages, the place that brokered the sales, you know, we should be prepared, you know what I mean? Like, there's a whole, I wouldn't just step into that arena without having like support boundaries you know questions like making sure like this is who I want to meet with and making it very I mean it's not going to be a safe place but if I if I had chose to do that you know like later on because I don't it was kind of like we're going to go back there and see the orphanage so I didn't really have a choice in it you know what I mean and I didn't know what I was getting into so yeah I don't know that I would I would choose on adult terms, like on my terms, if I was going to go back a, a different way. So I don't re recommend anyone to go back to an orphanage without like having like a care plan, some support boundaries, like if they have questions, who they want to meet with and, you know, being kind of in control of the situation so they don't get re-traumatized by it. That sounds really insensitive. Like it was never yeah. your choice to return. Like no, no. I mean, it was just kind of like the whole trip was just kind of like, yeah. I mean, there weren't they weren't people that supported or even saw adoption as a bad thing or took any accountability. It was more like the white savior, like we rescued you. You have this great life. You know, we're doing all these things. So if we're doing these things, you owe us this for this. Everything was very strings attached conditional I I you know it was always like always kind of like thrown in my face so I was well aware of the transactionality I don't know if that's a word but you know how it's a transaction and how everything is you know very very conditional so mm -hmm. yeah not safe people to talk about you know anything with that and I didn't process that for a long time because as an 18 year old you know young adult it takes time to you know, unlearn and decolonize and do the work and connect with people. So that kind of like didn't really get dealt with for so long because I was just like at a different, you know, point in my life. Like I didn't see them as like safe people. I didn't see them as people that, you know, it's just kind of like when you're stuck in that situation, it's like survival. You have to do what it takes to survive. So I think we all adapt to whatever that situation is and whatever coping mechanisms you know, but yeah, I never, yeah, I didn't really identify. I always felt like an outsider. Um, and you know what I mean? So I, I didn't identify. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Did they, did they um have any other children? They had, um they adopted a white child from foster care who was two years younger than I am. Mm. So that adds like a whole nother level of, I mean, just think about that. And it's like here in the United States, it's, foster care is not supposed to be a pipeline to adoption. Like you're not, foster care is supposed to be about getting the child back with their family, right? It's not how it's, it's like, it's a myth. It's not really what it does. So it's like that child has been in foster care for two years, right? And imagine all the trauma and then they come into this other situation. So it's adding all this other trauma. And if these people aren't aware, you know, or supportive or safe, just imagine that dynamic of that, I wouldn't call it a family, um, maybe group. How, how did you like connect with this new sibling, like this new or person in your, in, in the, in the family or group, whatever? Yeah, I don't, we didn't really connect some, I mean, it was again, like another 
outsider because he was white and I'm not white and the buyers were white so it was like another othering kind of situation and we were very different people so you know he's a boy two years younger we had very different coping mechanisms um so I don't know that we identify like we didn't really connect so much you know and each of each like I think each person in that kind of group or family everyone identifies differently and does what they need to survive so there can be you know some people later on maybe are still in that situation you know what I mean and they don't you know they're just like under the wing so people have different ways of like getting out like getting out and moving on and whatever but I don't think we ever really connected it was just kind of like you you have to like live in the same space you know and I guess we were like typical, like we, we argued and stuff like that, but we weren't like best friends or, you know, friends and we, we don't have a relationship to this day either. So yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was a process because I think so many of us, we set a boundary, like where we're done. And then those people keep like coming over our boundary and pushing the boundary and sending emails and sending letters and showing up and all these things. So it's really like I was at a certain point, which was 2012, um, but it didn't quite end. It was like another four years on their part where they finally just, you know, it was continual. <laughs> you know what I mean? I was like, I was done and I had set my boundary and it was not respected. So, um, so it's been what's seven years it's been seven years since we haven't my math's lowered seven years since we haven't had any contact um but I think like as I started doing the work and reading more and like connecting like social media as like bad and good as it is like yeah there's a lot of bad parts of social media and there were some really great parts for me because I was able to find community. I was able to find people that were like saying the things that I hadn't been able to say and you kind of like resonate and then you connect with them and it kind of like, you know, it, it helps like the unlearning, it helps with the disconnection and it helps with like the, <clears throat> the reclamation. And I also started, I had therapy with somebody who I was in therapy with someone who was an adopted person. So that really helped because it was like the first time where someone was like actually able to like validate and I hadn't had anyone like validate the experience prior to that. So that was really helpful, you know, and then reading books, you know, and just hearing experiences like, oh, wow, like that's, I'm not like alone in this and wow, like what I thought was like what I always felt like this is the truth. It's been validated. Like this wasn't right. Like there, this this wasn't how it was supposed to be like all these things are trauma like everything that I kind of knew that I couldn't name was out there so then I just started connecting more and more with people and the more I found people to connect with that like it was really like life-saving really helpful it was validating like it was the first time I felt like validated and seen and heard and then it just kind of like empowered me to you know just continue on this path right and to like start sharing and then like, you know, kind of create like a space on social media also. Because there's so much we can learn from each other. There's so much we can learn together. There's so much each of us can teach other people. So it's like when we connect, you know, our chances of learning and all that, it's like just empowering, right? Because someone has like, some information that I don't have. I have information they don't have. So it's like, I think it just makes everything stronger. So I'd say like this, the, just finding the community was like a big, big step in terms of like, create like who I am today and who I've become and like what I do now. Like it was really, um, I wish I had had that earlier. Right. Cause it's like, it seems like a lot of us feel like we're starting, we start like kind of like coming out of like coming into ourselves you know and reclaiming things like later on you know what I mean so I wish I had had that 
like in my 20s and I see like a lot of adopted and displaced people now have that because I connect with them and I'm sure you connect with them online and they're at a different space than I was when I was 20 years old and it might just be like times are different or you know there's more access to like community and social media and there is more um, coverage in the media about you know, what is known as adoption. It's not always done in a great way, but it's like, we are starting to get heard a little bit, even if like a lot of the articles are like not done in the way we'd want, but I feel like we're starting to have a little bit more, um, like it wasn't like that, like 20 years ago, it wasn't like that, you know, I wasn't alive 50 years ago, but it wasn't like that either. So I think like, that's really helpful as, as bad as social media can be, as bad as the internet can be, it is helpful because it gives people, you know, access to find the information, um, which I think is really important because it was not available, you know, up until like, you know, recently and, or you had to like find it a different way and it, like social media is so instant and so easy to connect. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Like, it's good to see. I mean, it's like, we all deserve to see people that look like us, you know, and it's like, we all deserve to see that genetic mirroring, the racial mirroring, but I think it's like so powerful when we go through so long, you know, looking for it and yearning for it and doing anything to find it. And then we finally find it. I think it's like, there's not a language to explain what that's like, because there are people, there's plenty of people that are not adopted, not displaced, right? So they are able to see, you know, themselves in family members their whole life, right? And I think, you know, for us not being able to see that, and some of us may never see it, like we don't find our families, or maybe we don't want to or whatever, but I think it's a, it's a right, like everyone deserves to be able to see that, because it does such a, it's so much trauma, and it does a lot psychologically not to see that. I think it slows down a lot of like learning, and a lot of different things we could be doing, because our brain is so, you know, and our body and our nervous system is so we want to be in tune with seeing that so I think it does have a very adverse effect or impact on us when we're a lot of our time is spent like looking when we go on public looking for genetic you know like looking for the racial mirroring like you know and or searching and hoping we're gonna find our family so yeah it does it's just like it's really an in inhumane place to put people in it just really um it's not it's not good psychologically it's not good on any level so yeah I mean I think seeing people um it really it does a lot but it's also just like it opens up more wounds because then you realize like I've missed this and I'm at this age and you know your relationship is never going to be what it would be had you lived there it just never is like I mean, maybe someone has that and they can re like just say, oh no, that's not true. And that's their experience. But I don't think you can make up for any of that lost time. Yes, you can form a relationship. Yes, it's going to take a lot of time and a lot of effort, but you can't make up for that time. And it's never going to be as if you were there from, you know, the beginning till now. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 So it's like, did did you ever consider like moving there to Colombia or do you spend like time there are you able to yeah. yeah I don't right now I'd like to um it just hasn't been feasible with my life at this point you know maybe in time I don't I don't speak the language you know I don't speak Spanish so I would have to you know work on that and then figure out, you know, I'm a, I'm a parent now, so I'm raising kids. So it's, I can't, you know what I mean? It's like the kids are going to come, my kids come first before that. So I can't just like pick up and, you know, go for a short period of time. So in time, yes, I'd love to bring my kids back and do that. But right now it hasn't been feasible. And I haven't really thought like long-term, you know, I've been so concerned about like, you know, the immediate, the now, right. So I don't know. I don't know what that looks like. I have a lot of friends that spend time in Colombia or they want to move there or um, they want like a second house there. But I do have a lot of people like that. I just it just hasn't been um, feasible for my life at this point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But do you feel like a strong connection to it and the culture and this sort of 
a a little bit like I'm trying to reclaim it I feel like a a disconnect because it's been you know like so long I mean it's like my life has been so Americanized and I'm here and I feel like when I went back it was such a like traumatizing experience I wasn't able to like um connect you know and be like there and present and I was a different space in my life and I wasn't you know their support so I feel like that trip was kind of you know after that orphanage experience it was kind of traumatizing so I was like you know I I don't know like I want to go back in a safer time but I don't I have a lot of friends that like yearn and really miss it and want to be back and they like will say like they step like into the country and they feel like their nervous system relax and you know they're just like I want to be here and they're so sad to come home I don't know that I f- I don't know at this point just because I haven't been back another time where it's been safe um and I think I've just been so concentrated on everything here you know what I mean like yes I want to go back um but I don't I don't know what that means you know what I mean I don't I don't know yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah no that's and also going back or going home or whatever can be yeah. like um <clears throat> you know like home doesn't have to be a place it's like a feeling. definitely yeah you exactly that you had a reunion like what happened yes. what happened when um, what was on it was on zoom because I couldn't you know what I mean like I can't or it was like Skype I'm sorry it was on Skype I can't like I couldn't go back and I don't speak the language so when I did I did it with um, I had a friend translating for me because she speaks Spanish. And then I did it a couple other times and I had Google, tra- you know, I had Google Translate, which is a pain because it's like, I don't know like how the translation works. So it was a lot of that, which is really frustrating because it's like you find your family and you don't speak the language. And then there's like that barrier of social, you know, like this is a screen, right? This isn't like actual it's a step up from like email or a phone call but you can't hug the people you can't like you know have food with them and sit with them and it's so it's like it's really I mean I'm grateful for it which is really like kind of like it's a low bar right so it's like I'm so happy for this but it really in the end it's just like it's inhumane that this is the way this had to go But then also it's like, I have to say, like, there's a lot of other people, a lot of other adopted people that are never going to find their family. And they would be like, so happy if they could have that, you know, Skype interaction. So it's all with like perspective, right? Like it's great, but I think with reunion, society tends to glamorize it and make it like this great, amazing, beautiful thing. Like everything is just like happy, happy ending. It's all over, but I don't think that's what it is. It again, it opens up more wounds. It opens up more loss. It opens up more grief. It opens up a lot more. It doesn't solve, like at least in my situation, I don't feel like it solved everything. And I'm like, oh, okay, reunion, like all the voids are filled. Everything's good. I'm, you know, and I talk to a lot of other people and they'd say the same thing. So maybe for one person or a couple people out there, however many people might solve everything. And they're like, okay, this is, but for me, it wasn't like, okay, this is the end. This is great. Happily ever after. Cause it just opens up more stuff because then you have to navigate relationships with people in a different country in a different language. And not everybody is going to come with the same level of like accessibility to support to therapy, to, you know, access about, um, like unlearning to, you know, books, to the internet, all these things. So it's like where I am and what I have learned doesn't always, it's not going to align with everybody else. So it's like, there's a reunion and like, not everyone has done the same amount of stuff. So it's like, there is going to be pushback. There is going to be it's just not an easy fit. Like you can't guarantee everyone's in the same place, you know, and, and some people come and they might, you know, they haven't dealt with it. So that could be very traumatizing to them. You know, if one person's like, oh, here, like they've done all this reading and the other person's just like, oh, I just put this out of my mind, you know, and they never dealt with it. That's, I think that's a reality for so many people in reunions. So I don't think it's like, it's a, it just, it just opens up. It creates more work for us to do. Yeah, definitely. The yeah. same. Yeah. I can really relate to that. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
did your did you meet your mum and did she talk mm. about sort of um like what it was like to have to was she was forced to relinquish you? I would say she was I don't know if she realized that you know what I mean um definitely from like doing the work and like researching the orphanage and like yeah she was definitely coerced I don't know if she was I don't know if she could say that or admit that you know um because it's like it's hard when you finally see someone like I didn't want to ask like a ton of questions at first because it's like if I come asking all these questions it's like I'm demanding all these things and also it can push someone away so like in a relationship you want to take it slow so I didn't like ask a ton of like those questions I was like just most looking for like connection I don't want to push anyone away with like all these demands and questions and I don't know where they are on everything have they dealt with it have they thought about this you know what I mean like so I can't assume that everybody's in the place I am so I didn't ask a lot of the hard questions but I'm gonna say yeah she was definitely yeah she was definitely from the things that she did say and just knowing the orphanage and just the whole situation yeah it wasn't something that she wanted as we know like most mothers or pregnant people that's not something that they want they're coerced they're forced they're in a desperate situation they're in a tough situation they're made to feel they're not worthy to raise their own kids they're not capable if they don't have the money it's always like oh there's these people that have money and they're white and they live here and they can provide this better life or maybe they're not married you know and like so often marriage is like it has been for a while like the 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 hetero sexual marriage is like the heteronormative is like what has been used for adoption because it was like only like hetero people could adopt for a while and it was like single people couldn't but things are opening up right but yeah so I think yeah so I don't I haven't met any I've met people that say they want they wanted to do this but then in the things they say it really is conflicting because they were coarse, they were manipulated, they were gaslit, you know, they were just basically um, taken advantage of. Starting to do the work then, um, I was definitely starting to do the work. And then after I did the reunion, I'm trying to remember, after I, I think I was starting to do the work. And then after I did the reunion, like I just immersed myself in the work, because I was like, oh, I want to understand like, all moms, I want to understand all this stuff. So that's what kind of like, catapulted like the you know trying to like learn more and I wasn't I was 38 I'm trying to remember was I th- yeah I was like 38 at the time um when I did the reunion so it's like yeah that's like is later than you and it's like I wasn't completely like I don't think we can ever be prepared for a reunion like yeah you can do all the work and it's like something I don't, I don't, I don't believe we can be completely prepared for it. Cause how, how can you, when there's like so many unknowns and so many other people at, that are at different spots and like we or them can activate each other based on where we are, you know? So yeah, I wasn't, a, I wasn't, hadn't done like a ton of it at that point. It was more so like doing in the reunion, it just kind of like catapulted me into like, I need to like do this you know, and do the work and understand like what happened here. So yeah, but it's a lot of work because it's like a lot of um, trying to find like, what am I looking for? And there's so much like adoption is such a Pandora's box. There's so many different, like you take one country and like, yes, it's similar yet different from another country. So it's like, it's very there's so many people that hold the information, but you need to know where to go for it, you know? And so it's a lot of just investigation and asking like, you know, what book should I read on this? And like knowing who to ask what. And um, yeah, I mean, it's like kind of like a, like a private investigator kind of thing. I feel like it's like a, a scavenger hunt to like find the information because there's not one there's not one book or one website or one place that holds everything because it's like there's so many there's different kinds of adoption there's different countries there's different like laws got governing all of this everyone's lived experience is a little different yet similar so it's like 
I'm still learning. Like I'm still learning. There's still so much to learn. Like you open up one thing and then it's like something else happens. And, you know, we watch, we're, we see the news and it's like these different um, countries are investigating illegal, like the adoption was corrupt and illegal. So it's like, not that we're surprised, but it's like more, more things open up and lead to each other. And we're seeing, you know, more stuff in the news. And yeah, it's just like, I don't think you could ever completely learn everything, you know, like, cause there's like so many, there's, um, you know, all the isms that adoptions, you know, the foundations of them. So it's like, we're on, like I'm unlearning, like all these different things, like, cause I'm indoctrinated to them too. Like I lived here. And so like, this is what I was forced to assimilate to. So it's like anti-racism, being anti-racist, learning about, you know, white supremacy, all these different things, like the heteronormativity, the capitalism, and I've been indoctrinated to all of that. So it's like, it's a constant learning and unlearning, you know, of things that I was like, oh, I, I learned this, but yeah, that's really not right. So I think it's just like, it's so important to do it, but it is like a, it's a, it's a huge task. Like it's a lifelong task. And I think we have to do it like sometimes we have to do it in increments and sometimes we get really tired from it and it can become very very overwhelming and, and you know and you can get very angry or very sad and it's that's fine that's normal but I think sometimes we have to take breaks too and take care of ourselves because it can just be so overwhelming and exhausting with the breadth of information that we are learning and just like to to like connect the dots and also realize like this happened to me and it's like really an odd you know just to think like this is how this is how it started for me like I was taken away from my mother at birth and then I was bought and sold and then I was taken 2,000 miles you know like all these different things and you're like wow and I think as I get older and I have I have children of my own I'm like wow like I can't imagine that happening to them but then it's like oh that happened to me so it's like like living with those impacts, you know, and like, this is the reality for us. So I think it's a lot, it's a lot to take in. Like, it's just, it's a lot. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. It's, yeah. And it, and it doesn't stop. It's like, it, it does, it, it, you know, it's trauma. So it's like unsayable and it's trying to bring that into language. And yeah. yeah. Did, did you feel changed by um, having children? I mean, I'm sure that's a stupid question but you know did did that open up any sort of uh doors about your own experience did that make you more curious about trying to find yeah something? I think I think being a parent is probably the most activating thing because it's like then we realize like these are all the things like I'm like these are all the things I didn't have and it becomes more like uh, it's not like an abstract thing. It's like a real thing, you know? So it's like, I think that has like also pushed me to do the work more because I don't want to, um, I want to be, you know, a good parent to them. I want to have boundaries, all these things. I want to do the work. So I'm not, you know, creating more trauma for them, even though like this is part of their lived experience. So it's like the trauma of adoption does pass to generation. We know this. So I want to do whatever I can on my part to be healthy where it's like, I'm a healthy mother. I'm a healthy parent. Um, I'm able to like parent, you know, do my stuff alone, do my stuff with boundaries, you know? So I think it really has pushed me to work on my stuff more. Whereas I could see maybe if I hadn't had children, I wouldn't have all these things being activated constantly where it's like, you can kind of push it and ignore I mean I don't know I think it would be easier for me if I didn't because I would just be like oh you know I can just kind of ignore it and you're not going to have the same kind of activation as if you're a parent so I think it it really did push me to again do more work you know therapy all the different kinds of modalities that I can do so I can be the healthiest you know parent for my kids and be you know present so just thinking about your adoptive um the 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 ones who bought you I like that by the way I've never <laughs> you feel like they did did they were they ever curious about doing any of this work or trying to understand adoption did they have show any curiosity at all no it was just like the white 
like the white savior we rescued you you have this better life you know like no 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 there was never any talk about you know family separation or the trauma or the grief or the loss it was never acknowledged so yeah I don't think that they were people that are you know capable of introspection or interested in like you know digging deeper and doing the work yeah do you miss them no I don't I wish I had I actually wish I had done that earlier in my life because I feel like it created more it created more trauma right I wish I had distanced myself or estranged myself like right after like high school and I feel like my life would have been different I would have probably started to work sooner because it's like you know the saying we can't really heal until we're safe Mm -hmm. and that holds true so it's like if we're surrounded by people that are not safe people we're not in a position to like start doing the work because it's not safe we can't open ourselves up to them we can't be unguarded around them so it's like I mean in hindsight yeah like I wish I I wish I had done it sooner I didn't do it sooner it's like I did it when it was meant to be at the point but no I don't miss them I just realized like how much I wish I had done it earlier you know like how unhealthy that situation was and how I wish I had done it like as soon as possible did you ever get sort of told like that you needed to be grateful was there always a sense that they wanted you to be grateful for sure for sure everything was conditional um and then also just like the being told like we rescued you and what a messed up thing to tell someone like no one rescues anybody like we don't need to we didn't need to be rescued from our families and from our mothers you know like that didn't need to happen right so yeah it was like the sense of like everything's very conditional if you follow and do what we want then we can provide money we can provide this but if you don't then like everything's cut off and like we'll do the silent treatment and like all those kind of like emotionally you know abusive things so yeah it was very conditional and like very yeah like you're very um it's very apparent like you are here to do as we want right like whatever to fulfill like our needs and then if that doesn't happen then there will be like consequences or you'll be cut off or you know all these things so yeah it was like yeah very uh it was, I'm, I was very aware that I was like an outsider there did they did they do that to you a lot growing up and did you know that that was abusive did you yeah it happened a lot and I didn't know because it's like we're children so it's like whatever our situation is like that becomes like normal because we don't have the knowledge we don't have access our brains don't you know we're not able to do that and I think that's a survival I'm mean, kind of glad because had we known the reality of our situation but then yet being stuck and not being able to do anything I think that would be really torturous I didn't know it was abusive I mean I was a kid I'm like this is what happens here so you know I didn't know that and then I think as were like groomed in those situations it sets us up for other situations that are also going to be abusive and unhealthy so I did have other relationships that were like terrible relationships where that person would do the same thing and I didn't connect it because I'm like oh this is normal like I know it's not right I wouldn't do it to someone but it was just like the norm right this has happened to me as a child and then as I like left those relationships and went into therapy it was like I didn't, you know, they're like, the therapist is telling me like, this is emotionally abusive, but I'm like, I didn't, you know what I mean? It's like, I kind of knew, but I didn't know. So like now, obviously I know that, but I didn't, I didn't have that knowledge as a child or as a young adult or as like a later adult, because I did get into um, situations that were also like abusive because that's kind of what had been normal to me. And I didn't have support of like healthy people around me to say like, this isn't like normal, this isn't healthy, like, it would be great if you could get some support or read this book. So I like kind of was just like, finding all this on my own and like slowly kind of connecting and realizing like, this is like, not normal, this is not healthy, this is abusive, but it's like, it's a result from that situation and being groomed in those behaviors, and then still being in a relationship with those people So it's like, if I'm around people that are not healthy and safe and not healthy at all, right? I can't really, I'm probably not going to be the healthiest myself, right? And I'm going to also 
probably attract other people are, that are similar. So it was a lot of years of, you know, just being like, feeling like stuck, but thinking like, okay, this is normal. This is kind of what I deserve. This is what it is. So it takes, I think it takes time. Like anything, it's like, it's a progression. It takes time to break free. It takes time to recover. It's like a lifelong process. So yeah, I mean, it was just like that situation created so much, you know, like it was like just a trajectory of trauma because what I learned there just kind of continued in my other relationships for, for like years and years and years. And I'm sure like so many of us, it's like, mm. it's such a, like similar experience yet different experience. Yeah. But do you feel like the moment people like other adoptees and abuse survivors and displaced people uh, sort of come together, like find each other, mm -hmm. um, that there is a sort of strength in numbers thing is like there's a community that can be become powerful because um or empowered because um we sort of can recognize ourselves in each other and like um so I think so yeah I mean I think there's definitely empowerment and like strength in numbers but I also think depending on where people are in their journeys or paths there can be a lot of conflict. If you take a, any, if you take any community of trauma, you know, like you take a recovery space, you take an adapted displaced space, you take, you know, survivors of, you know, incest or sexual assault, or you take people that are in trauma and people are in different spaces. It can also lead to like the trauma bonding in relationships you know, or it can lead to unhealthy relationships. It can also lead to, you know, some great relationships, but some of the relationships, if we're not aware, we're emulating the same patterns and repeating them. So as great as we might be, or as much as we might relate, we can activate and hurt other people. So I think in these spaces, there can be, there's a lot of great things that happen. Absolutely. But there's also a lot of pain and like, kind of like reenactment that happens if we're not a if we're not aware right or if we're not yeah so it's I think it's like yes it's great but we also have to be aware of like sometimes these situations like we can really hurt each other we can cause more pain they can be more trauma so it's like just being aware of different things and people are able to bond so quickly because we're like oh you know I'm adopted this this and this we have all these things in common just automatically and we feel a connection like I don't need to explain myself to you you don't need to explain yourself to me so it's like it's a really fast connection and these fast connections cannot be they sometimes they're just it's anything that starts really fast can end really quickly or implode really poorly so as we build these relationships we have to kind of take it slow and and foster other things besides just like the trauma so we're not just having like this relationship where we're trauma dumping on each other and it's just trauma where it's like we have to take it slow too it's exciting that we found each other but I see so many times where it's like these relationships can be like they just implode they can be just tumultuous and again we're emulating different patterns that we've seen you know trauma survivors we have to be aware you know like and have boundaries and sometimes we don't have the boundaries and so um we're so excited to see each other but we also have to be careful in our relationships how we are in the relationship and making sure that we're you know being you know a safe person with other people and meet them where they are and whatever words they said I would validate them with those words so they could feel like validated and heard and you know seen and all those things um and if we got to a point where it was safe to say depending on what they said I'd say I'm so sorry this happened to you I'm so sorry you were separated from your family but I'd want to take it safe depending on where they were I would just like listen and validate and then um you know just kind of feel them out and if they were like looking for anything I'd be like would it be okay if I gave you some resources would you like more information and kind of then I could give them some resources but I would do what I could to validate them based on the words that they tell me so I'm making sure that I'm you know validating whatever their experience is because their experience is going to be you know different than mine and so doing whatever I can to validate so they feel like seen heard and validated asking like if we get to a point where it's like I could give them resources or references or if they wanted like 
to attend a panel or, you know, something like that. Like, but if we didn't get to that point, I, I definitely wouldn't push anything. I would just kind of follow their lead and validate them and listen. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And, but are there any sort of resources that you would really recommend for adoptees? Um, I would say, I mean, depending on where people are, right? Because I think any resources that I'm going to recommend are going to be activating even for you and I, and we've done work, right? And we're continuing to do work. These books will activate us. So, I mean, I think some of the great books are um, Catherine Joyce, The Child Catchers, that's an important book to read because it talks about adoption as a whole and how, and she's not an adoptive person or adoptive parent. So she has no, you know, stake in the discussion of adoption. So I like that perspective. She's just a journalist writing what she's learned. And her book is so like informative. I feel like it's life-changing. Um, that is a good one. I would say The Girls Who Went Away and it's older. It's by Ann Fessler. You, maybe you've read it. It, um, it's older and it's more, it's the, it's more of like a homogenous group of people. So it's not like a totally like inclusive, but it's written a while ago. But I think that book gives lots of insight into moms who have lost their children to adoption. And I think it's like the book where people will have the aha moment, like there's coercion, there's force, like these mothers didn't want to do this. So I think that's an important book. Um, I think any books by Dorothy Roberts are great. Like is she you know, does, has been doing research and work in the child welfare, child welfare, family policing system. So I think her work is very timely and important. Um, I'd say reading, I'm trying to think of what else. I would say reading books by adopted people. You know, there's a lot of works that are fiction and nonfiction. Reading those books, I would say, I don't recommend books by adopters or adoptive parents. I don't feel like those are the books that are speaking to our lived experience. They try to speak to our lived experience, but they're crossing the line. It's not their lived experience unless they're an adopter who is an adoptee, but then they need to disclose that. But they, then they also have like the bias of being an adoptive parent. So I would recommend books by adopted people because they're the ones that obviously have had the lived experience. I'm trying to think books on trauma. Um Gabor Mate, he writes a lot about trauma, done a lot of work. Um, Bruce Perry, um, also trauma, you know, just like reading books, you know, as much as possible on like adoption so you can understand adoption as it is and how did it become to be. Um, and then reading, the, you know, the lived experience, but then also realizing there is trauma. So reading, you know, from the trauma experts, those trauma experts don't really talk about adoption. So we kind of have to like connect the dots ourselves, but a lot of what you will read will be like, oh yeah, it's like, it's very similar. They're just not saying the word adoption in it. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. And um, uh, I won't keep you for much longer, but I just wanted to, would you mind uh, saying your podcast again? So that Oh yeah. It's called Rescripting the Narrative and it's available um, on Spotify and Apple Music on Anchor FM, and I can't think, there's a couple other ones, I can't remember what they are, but yeah, Rescripting the Narrative, um, we have a couple episodes, please listen, um, I, I would also say like podcasts are great, there's a lot of podcasts by adoptive people that are out there, there's a lot of like people that have platforms on social media that would be great to follow, I mean there's just like so many people, and then once you find one person, then you'll find other people, so that's also like a nice um, way to connect with people also. As you know, adopted, adopted people are four times more likely to attempt suicide. And that's an old study, like that's from 2013, I believe. So that's 10 years ago. So we know that's, it's outdated, but it, there is a lot to take from that in terms of like, we are at risk, you know, due to um, our lived experience. So there needs to be, you know, education about that awareness, about that support, um, I mean, it's a huge red flag and would be something that people need to consider if they're thinking about, you know, supporting adoption, um, politicians, you know, making money off of it, organizations, um, you know, because it's like if you, if we would do family preservation, right, and we would work to put resources into keeping families together and supporting families, that suicide rate would be reduced from adoption, like it would just be 
you know, it would be not there, right? So it's like family preservation would be suicide prevention. So I think it's important that um, there is a light shown on, you know, the intersection with suicide and adoption and displacement, because there's a big, big, big connection there. And it's something that we don't hear about in the news. We don't see in the media. We as adopted and displaced people know this because this is our lived experience. And we know other adopted people struggling with ideation, dealing with suicide attempts, and then death by suicide. And I would also like to add that there is that intersection with moms who have lost their children to adoption too. A lot of those moms are having parallel struggles in terms of suicidal ideation, suicide attempts and death by suicide. And that's something that is also not, you know, addressed. And a lot of people don't know about that, but it's important to shine a light on that too. So it's like, not only are the children that are, you know, displaced living with this, but the mothers are also, and there might be other family members living with it also. I mean, it's like, that's a huge, huge um, conversation that needs to be had in, 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 against adoption because if this is what we're kind of profiting off of and this is what we're commodifying you know what are we doing wrong here you know this is leading to um suicidal ideation and suicide deaths and suicide attempts and that's just you know we could alleviate all of this right so why are we why are we commodifying this so i think we need to have conversations about this there needs to be awareness um, I'd love to have a crisis line, um, actually not a crisis line, but a warm line that would be for adopted people. I mean, there's lines for other people. A lot of us feel we're alone. We don't have support. Um, it would be great if we had a place we could call or text where someone would understand us on the other line that was answering the phone. And it'll be great if we could have support, you know, so many people are struggling out there silently and then when we go into like to meet with medical professionals or any professionals, um, they don't understand. They're just like seeing us as like a suicide, a person with suicidal ideations. They're not connecting the dots as like displaced, adapted. This is trauma, which can therefore it's a risk factor for suicide. It's an adverse childhood experience. So it's like, we're just completely not being seen. We're being diagnosed. We're being prescribed medication. We're being sent to like, you know, forced to do this treatment. Right. But if we don't deal with the trauma, we can't, we're, we're doing nothing like medication by itself or forcing someone to do something and not acknowledging them is not going to be a way to help them. So it's going to create more trauma, more harm, and the person's going to feel more alone and more pathologized if they're not seen for, you know, why are they having suicidal ideations? Why did they attempt suicide? And we're missing that connection. We're creating more harm um, by the professionals and experts, which is really an injustice to people going to seek help because if that happens when you're going to seek help you're not going to go seek it again and you're going to know where not to go and you're going to know what not to say you're not going to be completely honest about what happened because you don't want to be you know forced to do these things or pathologized or not being seen so yeah it really is a conversation that we do need to be having and creating training about it and awareness so we can support because there are a bunch of people that are living with this right now. But if there's anything, you know, we can do, it would be have this conversation.